today, uh, and our, our message today is going to be called Another Kind of Food, Another Kind of Food, and we're going to get into what it means and what fasting is about, why we do it, and what's the purpose behind it. So if you have your Bibles today, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. Woo! Yes, just excited about the Bible, Matthew chapter 6, another kind of food, another kind of food. How many has eaten all kinds of foods over the holidays, Thanksgiving and coming into Christmas? We have all kinds of food. People make things during the Christmas time that they make no other time. Stuff that they make candy, dipping stuff. They're dipping stuff in chocolate that has no need to be dipped in chocolate. I mean, it's, that is not the fix-all to every dish. But no, it's a, it's a great time. Lots of creations, lots... Lots of, it'll fix a lot of things, though. It'll help a lot of foods. Dip it in some chocolate. <laughs> but in Matthew chapter 6, this is Jesus talking. He's giving them a little message here, and he's talking to people around him, and he talks about doing charitable deeds and giving to people and doing it discreetly, and not that uh, your right hand even knows what your left hand is doing, and, and uh, talks about praying and talks about the Father, he gives the, uh, the Lord's Prayer and <clears throat> gives an example of what praying is like and how to pray. But I want to start in verse 16. He says over here, moreover, when you fast, when you fast. Now notice he says not if you fast, but when you fast. When you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to, to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in the secret will reward you openly. Notice it says when you fast. So fasting is not something of if we will do, but it's something when we will do. Fasting is something that the Lord expected us to do as believers. And some, I get this all the time, say, well, I can't fast. Everyone could fast or Jesus wouldn't say do it. Now, how you fast is between you and the Lord and how you work that out. But to say I'm exempt from that, I believe, would be error. That God wants you to fast. There's a reason he wants us to fast. So what is fasting? You know, there's a lot of talk about it. Some people get a little freaked out about it. I want to describe what fasting is and, and what it is not. What fasting is not is simply going without food. That's not fasting. You can starve and not be fasting. I'm just going to not eat. Well, that's great, but that doesn't mean you're fasting. Fasting is doing without food for a spiritual purpose, that I have a spiritual purpose in mind. It's, something not, it's not something done by religious freaks only. I know I grew up for my whole life, and I never knew anybody that fasted. We never talked about fasting. We thought that was gone away with or something. We, you know, we thought that, that passed away or something. Nobody ever fasted. I thought that was only the same things that, that weird people did. But Jesus was one of those weird people, and he fasted. So what it is, again, I said biblical fasting is refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. There's all kinds of fasts. There's a complete fast, which was doing without food and water. That was done at times in the Bible. Doing without food and having only water. There's a partial fast, like Daniel fast, where you only fast certain things. And, uh, you know, that's something you can look up. You can Google Daniel fast and figure out what that is. There's also fasting, uh, other things like social media. You know, teenagers fasting their cell phones for 21 days. Might be worse than food for some. I don't know. Me fasting my phone for 21 days would probably be worse than food. Whatever it is, some things God's telling you. I encourage you, even if you're fasting other things, I would encourage you to consider some food. There's something about the flesh and the body and doing without food. There's something about saying no to king stomach. There's something different about when my body says, eat, and I say, no. My body says, come again? You never say no. When someone brings a freshly baked, soft, melted chocolate chip cookie across my path, and I say, no, my body goes, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> never do you say no to that. So there's something about saying no to certain kind of foods and, 
And so when we're fasting, it's when our hunger and thirst for God's ways supersede our hungering and thirsting for natural things. That's what fasting is about. The Bible says it this way in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, or righteousness could be God's way of doing things, God's way of being right, God's system, God's plan. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God's ways, for they shall be filled. So when I'm fasting, I'm saying, all right, I'm going to be hungering and thirsting for God's way more than I'm hungering and thirsting for my own. I'm going to be seeking after, I'm going after what God says about my life more than I'm doing my own pleasures. This is a place where we're starting to zero in on what God says and less in on what we say. Why is that important? In Romans chapter 10, verse 3, It says this verse, it says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Here's what that means. When we begin to, or when we stop seeking God's way of doing things, we can begin to come up with our own way of doing things. There's a verse in the Bible that says there's a way that seems right to a person, but the end of that is death. So there's all kinds of ways that seem right. And if we don't seek after God, we can begin to come up with some great ideas. But those great ideas could be absolutely wrong. This is what's happening in our society today, that we have no moral compass and there's no absolute truth. So now we begin to just come up with our own what is right and what is wrong. It's happening right now. We're seeing it in in a thematic way or or a popular way right now with the show Duck Dynasty where we begin, to, we begin to lose sight of what is the basis for truth. That if I have no basis, that, then I can just go back and I begin to make up things that I believe. I can just begin to make up things. Well, I think this is right. I think that is right. And we've got to have some way of coming down to what is right. And so we can't be ignorant of God's way and begin to establish our own way. We need to stick with God's way. So fasting is a time when I say no to my way and I focus on God's way. Because what happens in our society, I was hearing one person who wrote and said, you know, I'm just thankful that I raised my kids to accept everyone. And the problem is, is that this accepts everyone, but it doesn't accept every way. There's a big difference. I accept every person, but I don't accept every way. There's a way that seems right to a person. They can carry a sign and they can just, just uh, campaign and say, this is right, this is right, your angry face, right. You'll just say, really, I'm right, I'm right, and still be wrong. How many of you, how many of us have ever thought we were right when we was wrong? I'm the only one raising my hand. There we go. Many times I was adamant about my rightness. I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And it seemed so right to me, I would pick it for my rightness. But then when I measured it against the word of God, I found out I was wrong. One of the greatest things that God ever spoke to me was he said, Chad, don't get so caught up in your rightness that you end up being wrong. There's times that we can be right and be wrong. Here's what I mean. (laughs) Some of that was the face. Sometimes you can be right in your answer and be so focused on your rightness that you're attitude ends up being wrong about your rightness. And so you started out right, and God said, yes, you're right, son. And so you go around, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And he says, okay, now you're wrong. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's, It's making sure we realize that his way is what's most important, not ours. So fasting takes the focus off of our way of doing things and gets it on his way of doing things. Let me give you some biblical examples. Why to fast Adam and Eve? Why do we need to do without food? Adam and Eve, one meal, ate themselves out of house and home. (laughs) Food can be a problem. Some of you, it's kind of like a ripple effect. It's just rolling back and, hey, that was pretty good. So what I'm saying is food can be a problem. Moses, he received the Ten Commandments while he was on a fast. Joshua fasted. Esther, Esther was raised to a position 
to a platform for one purpose and one purpose alone. And Mordecai was so wise, he said, Esther, you can either fulfill the purpose of God or God will remove you and put someone else in there that will. This is why we should never, ever confuse platform for purpose. The only reason I'm put on a platform is for a godly purpose. If you're on a platform in your job, if you're a manager, you're a manager for a purpose. That's to be an example of Jesus Christ. You're never raised to a platform so that you can uh, placate yourself. You're never on a platform with a microphone so that it can be about you. You're on a platform for a purpose, and that's to point to Jesus and say he's the reason. So whatever you're doing, if you're over people, you're promoted to a supervisor position, great, you've been given a platform to show the principles of the kingdom of God. You don't have to preach to them. You don't have to tell them and uh, preach Bible verse to them every day, but you establish the principles as a leader, as a supervisor, and your whole workplace will be blessed because of you. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. So this is what, we, what we're supposed to do with this. So fasting, Jesus fasted in Matthew chapter 4. You remember that uh, he was fasting for 40 days and Satan came and tempted him and said, hey, Jesus, because it said afterward, he, I think this is one of the funniest verses, one of the most uh, obvious verses. It says, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward, he was hungry. <laughs> really. I go 40 hours, 40 minutes, really, rather, and I'm hungry. <laughs> so afterward, he was hungry, and so Satan comes and he says, hey, if you're the son of God, take those stones and turn them into bread. And what was Jesus' response? Dude, I can do that. He wasn't trying to impress the enemy. He was trying to obey God. Here's a, here's a valid point. This is almost parenthetical. It's not on the topic as much, but sometimes we need to focus on obeying God more than we are impressing the devil. Don't answer the devil. Don't debate the devil. Obey God. Sometimes we get chasing answering the devil, and we've got off course from where God wants us to be. So he answered God, and God said to him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Job says it this way, I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Here's an awesome scripture for fasting. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Why am I fasting? I'm fasting to say, God, what you say for my life, your direction for my life, my, your purpose for my life is more important than this meal. And it's saying to my flesh, it's saying, no, you do not rule me. The Bible rules me. What God says rule me. And when I begin to put what God says on the throne and what I think and what I feel off the throne, now I begin to get focus on my purpose and my direction. This is what fasting does. Fasting is not to move the hand of God. Fasting is not to, all right, Jesus, bless me. Bless, oh, well, you fasted? Well, you good little faster. Yes, you are. I'll go ahead and do it for you now. You went three days? My Lord, son, that's good. Three days. No, fasting isn't to impress God. Fasting isn't so God would say seven days. <laughs> Woo, wow, I'm going to bless you. Fasting moves me, me, me. It doesn't move God. Fasting moves my flesh out of the way where I can begin to hear God. Fasting silences the voice of my flesh and magnifies the, magnifies the voice of God. When you're fasting, your fleshly voice will start to get softer and softer and softer, and you will find the voice of God get louder and louder. The more you say no to the flesh, the more God's going to be clearer in your heart. He's been speaking all the time, but sometimes our flesh is so loud we can't hear him. It's not to get him to talk. He's always talking. Fasting is just so I can tune in to what he's saying. It's changing my, you know, remember some of us used to have that radio dial that you had to turn it to try and get the radio station and it would come in then go out. You'd have to get just the right spot right there, right, right. Sometimes that's what fasting does. It helps you tune in to the voice of God, get the right frequency. So now, why fast? Galatians chapter 5, verse 24 says it this way, those who, have crucified, who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. We need to crucify our flesh. We need to get rid of the passions and desires that's taking us away from what God wants us to do with our life and begin yielding to what God's saying for our hearts. Why do we need to crucify the flesh? What's the flesh? That's kind of a Christianese term. The flesh are just what this talks about, our natural unsaved desires, 
our natural unsaved desires. And we have to be able to say no to those natural desires and yes to God's desires. Why do we need to say no to those desires? Romans chapter 8, verse 13 says it this way. For if you live according to the flesh and are in obedience to the flesh, you will die. Is that a good reason to put to not listen to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So now let's find an example of this and see how it works. Go over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. You may remember this story. If you haven't read this story or aren't familiar with this story, I encourage you to read John chapter 4. Start in verse 1 and, and read down through it. There's a great story of, of Jesus interacting with a woman. He's not supposed to interact with a woman, let alone a Samaritan woman who is, who is a half Jew. They didn't like each other. They didn't talk to each other. There was a racial issue going on. And so they didn't work together very well, didn't like one another. The Jews, the Israelites would actually go around Samaria, wouldn't even walk through the town because of their racism that they had against this group of people. And, and back and forth, they shared the contempt for one another. But I want you to look in verse 27. And it says, At this point, his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime, while this is going on, so the woman, he's there talking with the woman. She puts her water pot down, goes into the community, begins to evangelize and begins to tell everybody, hey, come see the guy who's told me everything I've ever known about my life. He could be the Messiah. He's the one that could save us from all of our sin. Come meet him. So that she goes and tells them that. And while she's gone, the disciples had been gone to town while he's interacting with this woman. The disciples had gone to town to get some food because they were hungry. So they come back, and, and while, the, while the woman leaves, the disciples start urging him. Verse 31, the disciples urge him, saying, Rabbi, eat. You need to eat something. Get you something to eat. You look, you look famished. Eat. You're wasting away to nothing. Eat. Rabbi, Jesus, eat. Trying to put some food in his mouth. And he said to them, verse 32, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? They're like, did Jesus get delivery? You know, some takeout, somebody deliver him some food to get a pizza drive by. What happened? Who brought him some food? And so then he goes on in verse 34 and he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So when I say another kind of food today, here's what I want you to think about. There's something other than food that's supposed to help us. So let me give you the definition of food. I just looked this up in Webster. It's very basic. Food does three things. Number one, it supplies us, it nourishes us, and it sustains us. In its basic form, obviously we eat some just for entertainment. For some people, eating is an exhibition. It's just something you do for enjoyment. But food in its basic form it supplies us, it nourishes us, and it sustains us. So now if we put that in the context of this verse, notice what Jesus said. My supply, my nourishment, my sustenance comes from me doing the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So I want us to think about another kind of food than maybe we've normally thought about. If I look at the first one here, that food supplies us, Notice what he says, my, my food is to do the will of God. We need to concentrate, and that's what I'm praying for in this fasting, that you and I will spend time praying about, God, what is your will for my life? What is your will for my life? Because if I will do his will, I will get fed. Not just talking about natural food, but I will be supplied, I will be nourished, and I will be sustained. Notice what he says, that, you will, that I will do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Two things. The will of him who sent me speaks to your and my individual assignment. 
that I'm to pray, say, God, I want your, my food, my food, your food's going to be different from mine. Your purpose is different from mine. Your purpose is different from the person sitting beside you. Look at the person and tell them my purpose is different from yours. Now look at the person that was your second choice and tell them that my purpose is different from yours. <laughs> so now you, you're saying we're all different. We all got our own function. All got our own purpose. So when it says my prayer, my food is to do the will of him who sent that's my part that God's speaking to me about my purpose. So that's an individual. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus was saying, what, hey, disciples, dudes, I appreciate the sub sandwich. I appreciate that. I like the flatbread and all. That's good. But I've got food that you don't know about. Because my food, what supplies me, what nourishes me, what sustains me, is when I'm doing exactly what he put me on the earth to do. That's my food. That's my food. That's what brings me strength. That's what supports me. And not only do what he sent me to do, to finish his work. Whose work? Whose work? His work. It's not to finish my work. So here's the issue. Here's what I think we need to zero in on fasting time and praying time starting out this year is twofold. Number one, finding out, Lord, am I doing your will for my life? Am I doing your will? That's individual. Number two, of the purpose that is mine individually, how does it go in conjunction with your work, which is corporate? To finish his work. Whose work am I supposed to be about finishing on the earth? Mine? Well, I'm just working away. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I've got, I've got this plan. See, so many times, remember, we get our own way instead of seeking after God's way. And when we, when we aren't seeking God's way, we can come up with our own plan. And, and we, well, I'm going to take this career path, and, and I'm going to do this job, and, and I'm going to be this, and I'm going to do that. And you say, okay, did God want you to do that? I don't know. It's a good job. That's just what I'm going to do. What about his will for your life? The reason we're not nourished, reason too many people are malnourished spiritually and physically and emotionally because they're not doing his will, they're doing theirs. And it's not a condemnation, that's not a, a beat down, it's just realizing we need to ask Jesus, what is your will for my life? Before I sign up for college classes and figure out what my major is going to be, I might need to consider God, what's your will for my life? Before I spend all that money on a, on a degree and all that money to go in this direction, how about taking some time and saying, Lord, what's your will for my life? Because when you and I are in his will, we will be supplied. When I'm in his will, supply comes with me. When I'm in his will, nourishment comes with me. In other words, he starts it, he will progress it, and he will sustain it. So everything God's asked me to do, everything God's asked you to do, his will, you, we always talk about it this way, God's purpose brings God's provision. So whatever God's purposed you to do, he will provide for you. Don't think this way. Here's the biggest lie of the enemy. I don't say biggest, it's one of them. He's got a bunch of them. I want to do this. This is what's in me to do. This is in my heart, but I can't make any money at it. You hear me? That's the devil talking. This is what's in me. Man, this is what I want to do with my life, but I can't make any money at it. Don't listen to that lie. God's purpose brings God's provision. I don't know how you'll make money at it, but if God's called you to do it, he will provide for you. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's faithful to do that. So now we've got to figure out what is his will for my life? What does he want me to do? How does he want me to go about it? And then he says to finish his work. Now what is his work? We've got to be about finishing his work. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says it this way, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ or Jesus Christ. We know this verse. Maybe some people, maybe you can quote it, but I want to bring something out that's very important. Pay attention right now. Remember, there's a way that seems right to a person. The end of, the end of that is death. Being confident of this very thing. We've kind of read it over like this, that he who's begun a good work in me, he'll complete it. So God's going to do it. 
The only thing God, the only work that God will complete is the work that God began. If God did not begin that work in me, he is not obligated to complete it in me. The work that I begin, I have to complete. The work that I take on myself and say, this is what I want to do with my life. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this career path and I'm going to do this for X amount of years. And then I'm going to retire, head to the beach and enjoy the rest of my life. That may be fine for you if that's what you want to do. But if you began it, you have to complete it. But if I will allow him to begin the work in me, then he will complete that work. It may still be working at a job. See, this is not a message to say, well, we need to all go out and quit our jobs and go to the mission field. No, no. We need everybody in their workplace. We need the gospel in the workplace. We need, we need you to go into fields and bring the gospel in there. Covert operations where you're not supposed to talk about Jesus. And you go in there and you just live the light of God out and people are being born again and being saved. This is, but we got to realize the work that he begins, the one he will complete. Lastly, what is his work? Jesus said, I want to finish his work. What is his work? Look at verse 35. There's no question what his work is. Jesus said, do not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, look over there and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. What was Jesus pointing to? Jesus was pointing to the big, massive group of people that was coming from the town that the woman had went and said, come see a man that told me everything that I knew. Could he be the Christ? All those people were coming over the horizon and Jesus said, you want to know what his work is? Look there. The fields are white for harvest. That is the work that I've come here to complete. This is the work that we're all supposed to complete. But the enemy will try and get us where getting people saved is only for those called. But let me tell you something. What I want to pray for in 2014, if you'll bring up our next slide. This is a map of Southern Illinois, if you don't recognize it. God gave this to me in 2007. There's a long story on what that meant and, and when God began to speak to me prophetically about some things in this area, but I began to pray about this again for 2014, just God was bringing it out to us for prayer. And I read this here and he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food is to finish his work. What, his work, what is his work? The fields are white to harvest. Pray for laborers in harvest. So when you see in this area, if I give you just some quick statistics, North City, oh, I guess I got a little pointer here, North City right here in the middle of this circle. This map was given to me by God when he asked me to write the furthest points that we were drawing people from at the time. This is 2007, farthest north, south, east, and west. It was, and I picked out those points, and it was exactly 29 miles in every direction. And God, God began to show me some things through that. Again, I'm not going to bore you with the story of that right now. But that area has expanded further than 29 miles now, but that's, again, that's not the issue. Here's what I want you to realize. My food is to do his work, to finish his work. Right here, Hamilton, White, Gallatin, Saline County, four counties right there, statistically, conservative statistically, 25,000 people unchurched. 25,000. Did you hear the word thousand? 25,000. Not in all of southern Illinois, in the four counties right here where all of us live, maybe you live in Posey County. If you live in Posey County, there's another 10,000 people in Posey County, bringing the total of 35,000. Maybe you live in Wayne County. That, that number goes up again. If you live in, in Edwards County, God bless Edwards County. Then wherever you live, Jefferson County, Williamson County, Franklin County. So here's, here's what we began to do. As I was praying over this, God began to point out the cities that were circled. There were dots in a circle. And I noticed those cities, and I thought, well, what are those cities? And it came to my mind that those cities are the county seats. They're the county seats of that county. So God began to re reveal to me that those county seats were the place of government for a county. The government's in the county seat. So he said, I want you to begin to pray to take the county seats, because they're not only the county seats in the natural, they are the county seats in the spiritual that the spiritual government controls that whole county. 
So now here's what we're fasting for. I want you to forget about fasting for a new car. I want you to forget about fasting for a better job. I want you to forget about fasting for a new outfit. You can, you can fast, you know, there's subplots to all of our fasting, but here's what I'm saying corporately. Remember, number one is the will of God in your life. What has God created you to do? I want you to fast about that. Number two is finishing his work. So right now, I'm praying for at least 25, 30,000, however many people right here in our area to help finish his work. Can I get outside of myself? See, because here's what happens. Here's what the devil wants to do. He wants us to rock us to sleep. rock a chaddy in the treetop. And here's what he wants to sing to me. Take care of yourself. Don't worry about anybody else. As long as you're blessed, everything's fine. Just relax and don't worry. They're not your responsibility. I'm not sure if those are the exact lyrics, but it's something like that. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. This is the song of the enemy. While 30,000 people, 30,000 people are lost, who's going to go get them? Who's going to have a heart for people? Who's going to say 30,000 is too many? Who's going to be a part of a movement that says, you know what, I don't want just nice, cute services and then we go on about our lives. Who's saying, you know what, my neighbor's going to hell and I want to do something about it. Maybe your family members, my family members are part of that 30,000. Who's going to do something about it? Maybe your good friends are one of those 30,000. Who's going to do something about it? I tell you, prayer's going to do something about it. Not twisting the arm of God and saying, God, please, please. He already wants them saved. God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But who's going to pray down the strongholds that's blinding people's eyes? How many of them are like me that once I needed Jesus, but I was so blind I couldn't even see it? I couldn't even see what I needed, but somebody prayed for me. And God removed the scales off my eyes that I could see I needed a Savior. So here's what I want us to do. If you close your eyes with me today, I want us to pray about two things as we close. Hear me very clearly, clearly, pay attention. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. The question you should be asking the Lord right now, Lord, am I doing your will or am I doing my own? Am I doing what you've called me to do, what you've created me to do? Or did I just decide I'm gonna do this and hope you bless it? I wanna talk to you about another kind of food today. This another kind of food will supply all of your needs. It will nourish you and bring you strength and it will sustain you through difficult times. What kind of food is that? The food that is doing the will of your Father and finishing his work. So number one, you're asking yourself, you're saying, Lord, am I doing your will? And am I concerned about finishing your work or am I just concerned about finishing mine? Let me tell you the heart of America. Take care of number one. Take care of me, myself, and I. That song that the devil's singing to you, Don't worry about anybody else. Just take care of yourself. 30,000 people. That's too many for me. That's too many for me to go on just having cute services. It's too many for me to say, well, I just just want my own time. I just just gotta watch my show. 30,000. Who's gonna finish his cause? Who's gonna finish his work? No one of us can do it by ourselves. It's going to take all of us. Will you say yes to God? Don't say yes to me. You'll never be accountable to me. Are you doing the will of him who sent you? Are you doing it? 
Are you just talking about it? Some people, they talk a good game, but they don't do very much. Let's don't be talkers, let's be doers.